in an ideal world, I want to build an economy where brands can earn more with less, consumer can have more access with less cost and less waste. And then that is probably the ideal future of the fashion industry where we have our limited access, but we actually supply it in a much, much more smarter and more efficient way. Hello and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Formosa, the founder of Fashion Equipped and devourer of all things fashion, business and mindset. In this podcast, I'm speaking with thought leaders, change makers and entrepreneurs about the business side of fashion and everything in between. Fashion Business Mindset is your front row seat to real stories from designers, brands, entrepreneurs, makers and mentors. We'll discuss how to launch and grow a fashion business and give you insider access to the future of fashion. So let's do this together and ensure that you're equipped to make the fashion business your business. Welcome back to Fashion Business Mindset. My guest today is Shania Supasiratad. Shania is a change maker and creative thinker who set out to disrupt the fashion industry with the circular movement. Shania is the founder of Renta, a platform helping brands drive growth through re-commerce, which includes rental, resale and repair. Season after season, brands are struggling to maximise their ROI for each collection as trends move rapidly. Items are often being discounted and many are left unsold. At the same time, more and more consumers are participating in re-commerce, shifting towards more responsible consumption. For brands to tap into the benefits of rental, resale and repair, it can be costly and complex if done in-house. Now that's why Shania founded Renta. Shania and her team want every brand to have the opportunity to step into and profit from the circular economy while owning the re-commerce experience for their brand. I took so much away from this dynamic, insightful conversation with Shania, and no doubt you will too. So let's dive in. Shania, welcome to the Fashion Business Mindset Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for joining me. Now, before we dive into all of the dynamics of rental, which is impressive, can you please share with our audience just a little bit about yourself and your journey before launching your amazing business? Yes, of course. So my name is Shanya and um, I moved to Australia probably over just over 20 years ago. And I have this like really deep, passionate relationship with fashion since I was in Thailand growing up. It was kind of like my armor where I can, you know, rely on it to help me feel confidence and get through the day and, and all of that. So I moved to Australia and I worked in the fashion industry for probably about 12, 15 years. Then um, I realized that um, the industry that I love so much, I was doing um, a styling at the time. It's actually, you know, almost taking advantage of people on the planet, often people on the other side of the world. So I think when I started to learn that, it didn't really sit well with me anymore. Clothing, I used to call it like my second skin. And when you're starting to not feel comfortable in your second skin anymore, then you kind of try and find a way to, well, how do I help the industry that has given me so much kind of thing? So mm -hmm. I started my very first startup in 2016, 17. And Renter, this is essentially like a third iteration of what it was, yeah. So, Shania, I love that you've carved out a business model that's totally aligned with your values. Can you share with our audience what the re-commerce platform is and how it works? The re-commerce platform, well, in, in my version, is essentially the platform that bridged the gap between the industry and the re-commerce economy that is one of the fastest growing especially in the fashion industry. Yeah. Um, so what the e-commerce platform for us is essentially 
It's a platform that integrated onto any fashion brand website, enabling them to be able to offer rental, resales, or repair directly on their own website, which yeah. brand wasn't able to do that before because they're not equipped to, you know, to have all those all the logistics behind the scene or even just the technology to enable them to be able to do it. So yeah, for me, the yeah, the e-commerce market can only become a real solution in terms of sustainability if the industry brands and retailers are actually participating and embracing it. Yeah, what a great point. And how have you found the adoption of the platform? Just like any innovation in the beginning was really hard. (laughs) I mean, we all know that rental, resales, repair, all this trade has been around for a really long time. Yeah. No one has ever really disrupted the customer journey of it. It's always, if you want to rent something, you go to a rental website, then you rent it. You want to resale or buy pre-love then you go to a marketplace yeah. or if you wanted to get a repair, then you walk down the street, go to your local repair shop kind of thing. Yeah. And when we started, you know, when I started to think about how, why do they all need to be separated? Why don't they just be in one place? Why don't brands just take back the ownership and own that product and own that customer, own all of that data and like really stand behind that product? So that's when I started building this integration. And I think the adoption was probably first question that I get asked a lot was, um, would this cannibalize our actual, the usual business? Yes. And of course, you know, you're running a business. You want to know whether like if I'm doing the innovation and it's completely killed a business, then you can't do that. But now that we're, you know, live with multi-brands and we're able to prove it out that they're just two different customers. And also they're not cannibalizing, they're actually really complementing. Yeah. And who is that core customer? Who's the consumer that you're seeing that is heavily engaged in your site at the moment? So the, when when we onboard brand, what we usually tell them is we want, because uh, it's essentially the software is sitting on the brand website. Yeah. So what we're trying to tell brand is we're capturing, you know, those like 80% of people that come to your website and you're not converting because they can't reach that price point or for whatever reason, they you, you just have their there, they're your aspiration customer, that like they love the brand, they check you out, they're there for a reason and you're not converting them. Now you're giving them a different offer and then have a higher chance of converting them in a different offer. Yeah. So what you will find is um, for rental, you get the customer who's just like, um, a, more like a millennial, I say resale is probably more Gen Z. Millennials is like, you know, 25 up to about 40 years old. And they, the one that actually conscious about how they spend money. And also, I think it's just the generation that care a little less about ownership and more about usership. Yeah. Just want to have access to. Great. Yeah. So you're seeing really there's several benefits so you're offering something new to the existing customer and as you said there are customers perhaps coming to the site that you know they're about to leave not going to buy but now the brand is offering something new and as you said for those who aren't so perhaps don't want to maybe invest in the price points or like you said they it's not the ownership is not as important to their, you know, shopping their values. Um, yeah. The brand is basically adding an other layer to the brand oh, yeah. experience, which I think is really quite powerful. Yeah. Can we share with the audience what kind of brands you're actually attracting to Renta? And yeah, I'd love to hear, because I know you've had some phenomenal brands join recently. Yeah. Um, probably one of the biggest launch we had was toward end of last year. And we launched with Oraton, which is like, you know, Australia home brands been around for 85 years. The yeah. fact that they are moving into, you know, more like innovative space and capturing a different audience was um, pretty excited for us to be able to deliver that for them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, with Oraton launch, it was, um, we were kind of, I mean, before we launched with them, we did a case study within like ourselves as well. We yeah. have a few of that product. We rented it out ourselves. 
so we know how many time and like who's gonna rent it and all of these things we were able to do like incredible um case study and that was one of the reasons why like we were able to onboard them yeah they have one of their dresses that like sold out december 21 this beautiful long pink gown and we were able to get a whole of it size 8 and 12 yeah and because it sold out online we were able to get it from facebook marketplace okay. it has been one once both of them and they sold it back to us at literally the same re- retail price and from then within 8 months i believe we were able to rent it out both of them 24 times wow Wow. It was incredible. Like, first of all, I it was silk, like bright pink silk. First of all, I didn't even realize that it can be dry clean 24 times. I think the brand was quite surprised themselves as well. So then after that, we move it into resale. So we sell it off at 50% of the price that we purchased it from. So that was actually quite incredible. And then one of the dress, we kind of like, let's push this case study a bit further. We contacted the customer and go, do you want to sell it back to us? And we'll resell it again. So we did literally resell that dress for time. Wow. Wow. Was, well, that's a that's a true circular economy, right? Yeah, Keeping that product absolutely. in circulation for as long as you can. Yeah. I'd love to share the actual experience across those pillars. So, for example, customer comes to the site. What is the rental? Let's start with rental. What's that experience like? How long do you keep the garment? What's the whole logistical side like? Yeah. So as a consumer, you'll come to your favorite brand website. Right next to add to cart button, there'll be a rental button. So you select rental and then there'll be a pop-up for you to select the date and the size. And then once you add it to cart, then you go to the checkout, you give us the address. So now once you check out, now renter is taking care of the logistic on behalf of brand. So then we're like a third party that provide like that full suite. So then you'll get an email from us saying, hey, thanks for putting to reorder. And then people often book two weeks, three months, or even six months in advance. Mm-hmm. So it's, it is something that we need to also know when to ship it because you don't ship it straight away. So the order comes through. Yeah. And then once the order go out, they get an email saying your order's on the way. You can rent it for four days, eight days, 14 or 30 days. Okay. But this is also depending on whatever brands want to offer. Because yeah. for the brand, if, you know, we're talking about brands that do a lot more premium everyday wear, they could literally just cut the short term, like the four day and eight days and only do 14 and 30 days. So their customer can keep it for longer and mm-hmm. mix and match their wardrobe. So that's part of the, the flexibility that the software have. You can set your own price. You can set your own duration. The customer will have it for four day, eight day, wear it, get the return reminder email. And then in the package, there's a return like shipping label as well. Yeah. So you put everything back into the package, put the label on top and then ship it back to us. And then renter manage all the the care, the cleaning, and then put it back in the stock and ship it back out again. So that's like the full circle of rental. So it's very seamless for the customer. What have you learnt and your team learnt along the way? Because I'm assuming the initial logistics and process around renting may have may have been iterated over time. Were there any learnings in the early days that you just thought, oh, would have loved to have offered that, but that's actually not working. We need to we re- re- need to fine tune the business model. I think one of the key things that we still haven't really quite cracked was uh, the try on because mm. um, people do request a try on and we did offer like one day like 24 hour try on so you can book it and then you can have it for 24 hours and then you send it back and that was yeah. that would be like you can book it for like 50 dollars or something yeah okay and but what we found is because the hardest part about renting is you rely on a logistic company like career company yes even though they have it for one day it still take like you know, three days to send and three days to come back. So literally that particular item will be out for seven days. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like the whole things about rental is because margin for each rental is quite thin. What mm-hmm. you want to do with those items is you want to turn it around as much and as quick as possible. Mm-hmm. So when you've got that try on interrupting in between, it makes it really hard. So we haven't really been able to crack that. Um, we have very like very 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 small i say less than one point 
one point zero, sorry, zero point one, yeah, <laughs> percent of non return or damage beyond return. That was going to be a question. I was wondering, since you said, you know, you yeah. haven't cracked that try on, I was wondering what, you know, mm. how many customers perhaps receive the garment and go, oh, this doesn't fit or it's not quite right. Is that a very small percentage? Very small percentage yeah. as well, because the thing is, because we work with brands, what yeah. we can do when you, they're not sure is they can go into the brand, like to go in the store and try it on there, yeah. which will be easier than trying to get something delivered from us. Yes. Or even if you go in and try not exactly the same dress, you can kind of gauge the sizing mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. like something quite similar. So we've yeah. got that option for them. So the, the return rate for um for not fitting is yeah. probably I guess, less than 2%. It's really small. That's really good. In terms of damage, as you said, that's really small. So it's kind of a low risk, high reward model is what I'm hearing with the rental. No yeah. doubt in the future, Shania, there'll be some kind of technology. Of course, there's lots of fit technology out there now. There'll, there'll be AI. We'll be able to scan our bodies and make sure that uh, we're getting the right size. Yeah. I'm sure with you being a sound tech yeah. company, there'll be something <laughs> coming down the pipeline at us, right? Well, we actually were talking about, because um, it's fashion week at the moment yeah. um, in Sydney, yeah. and we had this like a, a fashion tech group um, discussion this morning we were having like coffee yeah. and there is one company that's working on it which is like they have been working on it for a really long time but the technology is now getting really really good so I was quite excited about their fitting room um, I think and it's just essentially that sort of 3D avatar which is will look as real and as close and the clothing is not just a 2D, but it's like a proper 3D. So you can see it drape and it's still properly. Yeah. So yeah. I'm quite excited about that. Yeah. Yeah, same. It's only going to get better and better, the technology, which will obviously benefit a business like yours. So I love yeah. that. Tick to the rental. Let's chat about the repairs. How do the repairs yeah. work? So we kick repair off. It's the last product that we just launched, which is probably about four weeks ago with our first brand, Shona Joy. Congrats. And well, thank you. When Shona Joy came to us, um, I think they already like have a plan for their sustainability and circularity roadmap. So this part of like the e-commerce, rental, resale and repair is kind of like, this is one of the key area that they kind of like, we want to focus on. But the reason why they pick repair first was also because they do know that a lot of their clothing, like their customer get alteration afterward. Yeah. So for them, how can we, and because they don't have store or for try on or anything, it's essentially people will buy it and we'll have to alter it. Like we'll go to alter and all of that. So they like, can we provide that from the minute that they're buying, like the, the experience. So we talk about how they want it to look like. And essentially, when you log into your customer account, um, you can go to alteration or repair button. And then it will ask you, prompt you like which product. And then it will ask you what needs to be done. And then get all the information. If you need to hem it up, we'll show you the guide of how you measure the hem or the stripe. Or like if you need to replace button or zip, we ask all those information. And at the end, um, and all those information, all those service, you'll see the fee of how much they cost. Mm -hmm. And then some brands actually will subsidize that. And for some brand, they'll use it as a customer loyalty program. So if you're a VIP customer, they'll pay for that for you. So you don't have to pay for it. Love yeah. It. But otherwise you can just go in, order it. Once you pay for this fee, we send out the shipping label, come back to us. We've got our partner to fix it. And then we ship it back to them. So from the brand perspective, it's completely hands off. Yeah. So, so look, I love that from a customer experience point of view. I mean, it really is adding value to the customer. Yes. How logistically will you handle that once you branch out and, and provide this for other brands? Obviously, logistically, you know, nationally, how, how do you have a plan to um, roll it out? I think for the partners that we have, in terms of repairing, yep. we've, we're have we pretty good at the moment. Like um, we've got a couple of partners that I select very carefully based on how we want to scale our business or our service. Like we've got one giant one that can definitely do scale and volume. We're yep. talking like, you know, we can do, you know, thousands a week. That's not a problem. And then we've got one that can do really tailored because, um, you know, if we're talking about brands like Shona Joy, brand like Alame, brand that like, Oraton, 
the level of the level of like the quality or like the same stress knowledge will have to be like slightly different than you know a bit more everyday wear kind of thing so we do have all those covered at the moment what I think I probably would like to go like next step once we go a bit bigger is I want to have them in different city yes at the moment it's all central in in Sydney because we tested them so much before we actually approve that they are our partner like which on a joy we probably tested I don't know 30 more than 30 40 items every single thing that we think that could possibly go wrong and then the, the brand actually like approve it that like this is they're happy with it yeah wow okay so you've gone through that proof of concept which I love yeah um, and then the last one is the resale let's touch on resale how that works oh resales is so exciting um so resale is basically allowing brands to become a marketplace of their own brand. A lot of brands already know that there is a Facebook marketplace of their own brand, like, you know, the Oraton buy, sell, swap, or same, Shona Joy, Scanlon, all of these brands already have that ecosystem existing, but they're not, it's not a safe platform. Like Alame, for example, there's so many counterfeit out there. Yeah. And so what, when we talk about it for them, they're kind of like, well, how do we provide a better experience for our customer? So then with the resales, when you purchase something from the brand, six months later, you can log back into your account and you see your past purchase and then you can select resale and then it will populate it back. And well, the form will pop up for you to actually add a bit more detail in terms of the condition of it, an actual real photo. So then once you submit it, get approved then it populated back on the brand free love page on their website so as the customer you can go to the brand and buy brand new whatever they have or you now have an option to buy past season or thing that has sold out and then the brand would just it could be like completely peer-to-peer so brand don't have to hold a stock and then that will be they would just take a cut essentially just like instead of you listing it on country ebay somewhere else then you're literally just listing it on your favorite brand side and then you have a higher chance of selling it at a higher price point essentially love it what a dynamic shopping experience yeah um, another really exciting uh, another exciting one that we actually also encourage our brands partner to do is is it's like a take back program yes. so what they can do is they actually offer you know a standard almost like discount or voucher and they'll get like buy whatever products that come in and then we get all of those products and we sort it. This needs to be refreshed, repair, or this needs to go to recycle. We re- refresh, repair it, and then put it back up for resale. And then essentially that like will be something the brand own again. Like one of our brand partners that we essentially will go live with um, soon. They actually became one of our investors as well, which is really exciting. Oh, they did a mini pilot. Yeah. Exciting. Congratulations. Um, you've, you've had so many milestone moments already, Chanya. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. It's still a lot more milestone according to um my investor. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a journey, especially when it's you're breaking new especially when you're breaking new ground, right? I mean, mm. you know, this is this is fairly new. So you're still breaking new ground. Business models are still being fine tune there's a lot to learn there's there's a lot of growth as well but no doubt you know there's going to have to be some pivots at times because it's such a fast paced um, area of our industry as well just quickly about the brands is it simple for them to get involved is this like a plug and play kind of opportunity for them because Mm -hmm. you know often there may be that little bit of a, a barrier for brands moving forward if they think it's going to be too complicated to get involved from what you've shared it seems like it's fairly seamless to get involved yeah for us we make it as like because we know that if we make it complicated brands will never do it because yeah. their resources would never like they would never have enough time they, like the team would just be like I can't take any more on so the way that we design it is literally it's like a, a script that it go on the brand side and yeah. that's all they have to do. Or if, even if they don't have a team, like a tech team in-house, we can actually add a script for them as well. And then they would just have a page and then literally everything else is on our end. We can just customize it to their font, their color, that like literally will skip us a brand guideline and we customize all of this building block 
yeah. of the journey of like each one of them to look and feel like it's actually part of your brand. Yeah, I think that's really important, isn't it? Having the support from your organisation to make it as simple as possible. You don't want to have any of those pain points that are going to stop um, someone adopting it because it's such a great opportunity. Now, we know that circularity, it's the forefront of everything we're doing in fashion at the moment. I'm sure you've got some compelling statistics or things that you can share. If there are any brands out there kind of on the fence at the moment in terms of, you know, embarking on rental repair and resale, what, what could you share with them? What I'm trying to tell brand today is like the option of you joining or not joining is no longer, like it's not an if anymore, it's when and how. Yeah. So what we're trying to do here is we want to help you have that strategy ready. So when the change accelerates, you're ready for it because the e-commerce market is growing because your consumer is driving it, has been driving it. So it's just a matter of time that you have to step in and be where they are. Just like when it was just brick and mortar and then people move online. If you're the last to move online, you probably will most likely get left behind. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, we're not going to have raw material for us to actually keep producing new items forever. Every single brand is going to have to find a strategy where, well, how do I make more money out of the item that I already produce? Yeah. Can I actually take it back and resell it again? Can I actually don't sell it and then keep making small increment and then like get a higher return? Yeah. So one of the really great brands, for example, unfortunately, we're not partnering with them, but they're in the UK, um, yeah. Selbridge, like yeah. Selbridges in the UK. Yeah. They came out and say, I think last year or two, that by 2030, they want 45% of their revenue to come from the 4R, which is rental, resale, refill, and repair. Mm. And it's just incredible for the leaders, like, you know, that leader to be able to see that, you know what, we have to shift. And it's yeah. not going to, like, 45% of revenue is not going to happen today, but we have to start today in mm. order for us to achieve that. So I think they did the pilot. The full full pilot was like a year ago and they released the start. I can't remember exactly how many million pounds they actually made. I think it was like 14 or 15 or something like that, but it was equivalent of about 2%. Wow. And that's like year one. Yeah, that's like a 15 million pounds without actually having to produce anything new. Yeah. And we all know that the emission of Every single item, the heaviest part is at producing. 70% of emission come from producing. So if you keep, if you produce something and you keep reusing it, keep making more money out of it, it's essentially like you're reducing that emission through utilization. Yes. Well, it's a huge number, isn't it? 45% of revenue. Like that is a huge goal. I know it's a few years, a few years down the track, but for a leader in the industry, a leading retailer in the industry to have that kind of goal, they're mm. pretty compelling numbers. So I think to your point for, you know, brands tuning in, you don't want to be left behind. And there are solutions such as Renta at your fingertips that you can integrate into your business immediately. So not getting involved, as you said, is no longer an option. You've just got to choose how you get involved. And obviously platforms like yours um, make it very accessible, make it doable. Yeah. Um, so it's just making that decision. I, I know that you touched on it earlier, but I think it warrants us recapping it. And I'll play devil's advocate. As you said, I'm sure brands have said to you, oh, Shania, it sounds great, great idea. But you know what? I don't want this impacting on my core business. So let's recap for the brands that are listening. What's your response when someone says that to you, that we don't want this eating into our core sales? So the case study that we've done with all of our brands partner now, we actually have proof. Because when I first launched, as much as I don't think it will, I wasn't sure. Because I was like, well, I guess we don't know until we roll it out. And then with every single brand partner that we work with, um, we did a case study and it turned out 60% of the rental and resale customer is completely brand new to the brand. You don't even have them in your database. So first of all, like literally, this is a completely new set of database that you're getting. And we've got the 30% that only purchase discount. So now you're actually getting more money out of them because they are now purchasing you like on sales only and then they're now renting. 
you also get your rental customer who come back and rent up to four to six times a year as well. Mm. So they're just, even though they're not buying, but when they spend, you know, 25% of the RRP, four to six times, that's essentially like buying. Yes. And the yeah. only the 10% of your, their full price customer that like we have to start, only renting sold out item because they don't have access to purchasing anymore. And yeah. you're still not disappointing them. You're literally allowing them to interact with your brand still, and they just don't have to own it. So yes. for us, I mean, I'm sure that as we get bigger and bigger and the volume has grown, there may be a small percentage of, you know, the cross. But that is showing pretty clear at the moment that they're just very different customer. Yeah. And then also, if we're talking about resales, your seller is essentially your most loyalty customer because now, 90% of your seller will select to get a gift voucher rather than cash. Right. So when they select to give a gift voucher as an incentive when the stuff is sold, then they'll spend that within 30 days. And yeah. often they'll spend it at 2.5 times higher. And then they spend that and they know that that's fine because later down the track, they will resell it again. Yeah. And then you, so you're capturing, like you're giving that, your your actual customer a reason to keep coming back mm. and repurchasing with you yeah. and then your the people that come and buy your pre-love item they 60 percent are completely brand new to you yeah. so then you're capturing completely new audience again the thing is it's like if you're worried about cannibalization like you might want to start thinking about like because it's happening with or without you mm -hmm. it's not like people can't buy and sell or rent your product anywhere else it's like they can they're just not doing it on your platform and you're not taking you're not taking a cut. You're not taking yeah. the ownership and you don't have that customer database that and then and then you essentially will be cut like you'll be cut out of that economy completely. Mm. Well, I'm not I'm not yeah. hearing any downsides at the moment. Everything you've just <laughs> shared is, you know, a win for a brand. I think it's important to touch on profitability though, of course. Mm. What is you know, what are the margins or profitability like in this space? You know, when you're talking about resale and you're talking about rental, just just so brands, you know, have some awareness around that. Yeah, of course. So I think you probably want to break it into, you know, your best selling will probably be the best product that you're doing in your e-commerce as well. Your best selling is going to be your best renting or will, will be your best like pre-love sales. So when you actually own that, product and then you actually either rent it out or like you literally like reselling it again and again you get the percentage of return on those items so much higher than just selling it once right and then you've got items that probably not performing as well but because it's such a lower commitment when someone's renting it mm -hmm. um, those items will also get rented as well yeah so when we're talking about um margin it's like every single time you rent something out i usually encourage them to rent it out at about 25 percent yeah so and then after all the costs and all of that you probably get left with about 60 percent of that 25 percent so if you rent it out probably twice then you'll make your cost back four or five times you make your whole sales and yeah. if you rent it out like literally seven eight times then it's literally equivalent of your rrp already yeah and it, yeah, on, on average at the moment, we're renting everything else. Um, you know, there'll be something that rented out once and then there'll be something that rented out like literally 30 times. Yeah. So you just kind of balance it out. But the beautiful things about it is once it's all like become X rental, yes. you can move them all into resale. So then you can actually resell them again at 50% of the price and to get like return back. Yeah. Essentially at this point, it is about like making your stock work harder for you. Yes. We have um, a couple of sold out items when we first launched Oraton last year. We rolled it out in beginning beginning of November and there was like three products that sold out within like four days. It was insane. Yeah. And then during the time that it was selling out, you can see that the rental booking was going up. And some of them were booked six months in advance. Like literally November, it's already got booking until Feb. Yeah. It was quite incredible. And then for them, they give us like a whole set size of like size 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. And of course, they can easily sell this five item at the full price because it's sold out, right? Yes. But yes. they didn't. And then through rental, this five item allowed them to interact with over 30 customers rather yeah, than wow. just five. 
Yeah. And then we actually got more return on those items like than just selling it already. Yeah, there's some incredible results there. And I guess you're not attracting leading brands for no reason. Um, the caliber of brands that you've got involved in the business, I think, speaks for itself. I'd love for you to share, Shania, what's your point of difference? I mean, there's lots of, you know, rental platforms out there. Obviously, you're offering the rental, the repair and the resale all in one. But based on others that are out there and, you know, other partners that brands have the option to work with, what mm -hmm. would you say is your your point of difference? I guess we're pretty much the only one in Australia market that's actually fully a white level where brands actually get to own everything on the journey, on the customer, on the data, and then like have to like and and also obviously like have the second like the revenue as part of that um we're not a rental platform we like we, we're not actually there to like rent out dresses ourselves yes. we don't purchase dresses we're literally a software company enabling brands to be able to do it and on top of that we're pretty much the only one as well that can do a full um circular logistic so we, we have like networks of partner that can handle all of the rental logistic, resale, take back um, and repair as well. And in terms of globally, I mean, there are a few resale, a few rental doing white level that we do, but we're pretty much the only one that can do three all in one. Yeah, amazing. Very important for our audience to know that. I think that point of difference is pretty powerful. Now, Shania, we don't do anything on our own in business. So I'd love for you to share who's on your team. Um, how does the business work? If you pull back the, the curtain and how do you market the business? We are just under three years old, um, even though I feel like I've been doing this for like 16 years. <laughs> um, so our team's still quite small. I yeah. have um, my CTO who I recently just met, co-founder, because he's incredible and I feel like Please do not leave me ever. <laughs> and, um, yeah, Ed and I have been working together for a really long time. He said to me once when we first started working together, he's like, anything you can imagine, I can make it happen. And I was like, man, it's a really dangerous thing to say to a founder. We are <laughs> delusional. <laughs> I think you should know that. Okay. So we are the core like team, which is like I do business development and business as you know, day to day, he built and deliver product. We've yeah. got um a team who's looking after operation, and then we've got networks of partner who manage the logistic behind the scene, and we have a couple of team overseas within like as part of the tech team. But we also got incredible um advisory board. I'm not sure yeah. if you're aware of Rosanna. She's um I think she was like an interim CEO. Rosanna for from Growth Act Growth Activist. That's it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I just else. just spent a week with her at Cotton Camp for Cotton Australia. So yeah, of she's course. she's amazing. Yeah, so Rosanna is one of our very early uh, advisor. Yeah. When we when we talk about it, she was like, This is it, this is the product that we need. Like it needs it sustainability need to need to be in line with commercial growth in order for the real shift to happen. So she's been like our biggest champion, which is like amazing. I'm not sure if you know that Martin, who's also worked with Rosanna, I don't know if he was at the cam as well. No, no. Yes, yeah, so Martin is also on our board as well. Amazing. Over 30 years of retail experience and we're backed by a couple of VC and a bunch of like incredible angels and also including, you know, a brand like Assembly Level also back at us. Yeah, fa fantastic. Yeah. I mean, to have, again, that calibre of support, that advisory, um, it's so important, isn't it, to be able to steer the business in the right direction because it is a complex landscape. So, you know, having the breadth of experience um, on the advisory board would just be absolutely invaluable, of course, in the early days and beyond. And then how do you get the word out there? So I know I know that you're active on socials. That's how I've connected with you through LinkedIn. I love that, you know, you keep everyone updated with what's happening and, you know, the milestones in the business. But how else, how do, how do brands find out about you? Um, at this point, it's a lot of 
like brands actually just like telling each other a bit, which is really nice. Referrals one of the best thing. Yeah. And obviously it's just like any B2B SaaS, we do outreach. So we constantly will go network event and we outreach to all the brand and yeah, the team would just start try and set up, we show the demo. And I think, yeah, the key really important part is just to make sure that like we do a really good job so that yeah. our brand partner actually do tell other people that like, hey, you should try this. I think that's probably going to be one thing that I, I really want to keep going. Also, another, like one of the campaign that we really want to do, but haven't been able to launch it, is essentially maybe we we'll use consumer power a little bit to hashtag the brand and, you know, like the brand that we can't penetrate in, the brand that we can't get in touch with, they don't want to talk to us. Um, maybe that consumer can tell them that, yeah. um, hey, Hashtag the brand, hashtag renter, get them to um, join the team. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be great. I think, you know, user generated content would be amazing to amplify. But I think, you know, again, it's an accolade to your business that you've got those referrals happening, that word of mouth, people advocating the business, having a good experience. You know, as a startup or in the early days of business, that's absolute gold to any business. So I think you've done an amazing job there. And like anyone, you know, using as, as many channels as we can um to to spread the word and of course even I know that you do a lot of public speaking like you're pretty vocal so I've loved seeing you you know kind of appear on the the speaking circuit as well now Shanya I'd love for you to share a little bit with our audience around your point of view when it comes to longevity in business in the fashion industry what do you see as you know some of the fundamentals the key strategies that need to be adopted to make it long term in our industry Oh God, business in general, I think great. You've <laughs> got to have great for sure. Yeah. Um, it's, and also I think be agile, be able to, to learn fast, test fast and fail fast and, and, and be able to adapt to things quickly just so that you can stay at the forefront because especially as a fashion brands as well there's no real real loyalty it's almost like season per season if this season you do well people love you and you'll be on top but because brands usually like brand usually make that collection what nine months or 18 months in advance right then you actually don't truly know what it's going to look like for you in 18 months I think to be able to adapt technology to to be agile about how you can shorten that timeline, how do you actually get the sample out without actually having to produce, or you know how do you get technology to help you actually achieve your growth slightly different way, and all, all of these things you just need to think beyond what's business as usual. Yeah. We're not going to have again. I think if we talk about this, we're not going to have the raw material. We're not going to have that luxury of keep using the new resources forever yeah. um it's really really important for people to even if like you know we're talking about the ceo or the founder of brand that maybe he's so privileged that never truly understand secondary market because they never actually have to buy or sell us anything secondhand or rent anything but look at what your consumer is doing but like literally look at who you're targeting and and I think I think listening to what the voice outside is doing probably quite important as well. Does that answer the question? Oh, it's great, <laughs> great, great insights and a powerful message. I think there's a lot of yeah. learnings in there. And I agree, you've got to move with the times. You, you just no longer is there an option to do nothing or, you mm. know, to be stagnant. It's it's now or never because, yeah. you know, everything's moving at such a fast pace now. Life, yeah. business technology it's all coming at us so yep. um as you said and that grit I love the word grit <laughs> you have to have it, it. If you don't have it then you know again it's not it's just not the reality to you know be in the industry long term it's um yeah you know you do have to have that resilience you gotta have resilience for sure yeah this week PE Nation yeah. change direction I don't know if you've seen the, the launching the ready to wear and all of that and that's just another, I, I, I haven't seen it. So I think it's showing at the, the fashion week. I'm not sure when, but that is one example of, they were like booming, especially during the 
COVID as well. Yep. It was like one of the brands that was growing insanely well, right? And then you probably hit the point where how many people can actually bu- keep buying active wear. Mm-hmm. When you go back to work and stuff, people don't really wear active wear to go to work and all of that. I think you're starting to see some of the needs drop. And then the brand just kind of listen to the trend, look around and then go pivot. Yeah, that's a pretty brave move, right? And we're, we're waiting to watch this space. I saw they wiped their entire Instagram. So that, yep. was the, that was the first indication. It's like, you know, yeah. change, change is coming. And look, it does take, you know, a level of bravery to do that, especially, you know, in a market mm-hmm. at the moment, which is pretty um, pretty vulnerable, you know, yes. and it's been a, a really tough start to the year. But as you said, you've got to, you've got to be brave. You've got to have that grit and you've got to know when, when the time is uh, to make that pivot. So yeah, very interesting one to watch that you've raised. So yeah, keep a lookout on, you know, what PE Nation does next, everyone. Yeah. Now, speaking (laughs) of grit, Chanya, I want to talk about how you manage your day to day. No doubt your role is demanding and dynamic. What are the mindset and self-care practices or routines that you prioritize to maintain balance and resilience amidst all of the demands of your role? I'm probably like not the best example, if I'm being honest. And I'm always honest. It's like, I'm just one of those. It's like one thing I do a lot is I'm very honest. I'm I'm super transparent as well. I just talk exactly how I think. um, So... I, I work really long hours just because there's just so much to do with a small team. I have incredible partner, like who he is, he understands. We've been together for nearly 10 years. So I think I was lucky in a way that relationship can take a little step back where it's become a foundation and I am allowed to go be stressed do other things that and and that would like my day is like I will wake up at seven eight o'clock depending on my first meeting and then I'll work through the day sometimes most of the time I don't even like get lunch it's just it's just keep going and then I'll get home and I'll probably do cooking or having dinner for a couple hours and then by the time it's nine o'clock or like 10 I'll jump back into computer again and I'll work right through till like midnight one o'clock and sometimes I have to stay with the tech team until four in the morning and then I might sleep in get up at nine kind of thing so I do work really long hours and I don't recommend that to anybody um, because I have had a lot of burnout a lot of breakdown a lot of things that I would just mentally have to push through and then even when I got sick I never really able to allow myself to be fully sick so then that take longer to recover or like and and then it's get to the point where beginning of this year I realized that this is a really really long game and I need to like try really hard to try and break that sort of routine I have to add in a certain thing to make sure that it's like, you know, I go for a run or all oh, the thing that I do is I walk to work. So that's 20 minutes and then I walk home 20 minutes. So that's kind of like my day, get clear head. And But usually when I walk, I just like talk on like business calls. I think I'm starting to realize that like I have to do better. Yeah. I'm not there yet, but I am at the place where I'm like, I know I have to do better. So pick up a bit of exercise to like, release the stress yeah and try to eat better I think like maybe at least eat lunch <laughs> yes, um, so, okay, yeah, gonna, that's probably, I, yeah. I need your phone number I'm going to text you at lunchtime each day and say Shania have you eaten you need to eat look I think I love your honesty I love your honesty because I ask this question to all of my guests And sometimes, you know, there's a beautiful, extravagant routine, you know, they'll have a a very set morning routine and, you know, there's a meditation and yoga and all of those things. And it can sound really wonderful, but it's a journey. And there's, there's seasons of life where you've just got to get things done, especially, you know, in the early days of business. And look, I've also faced burnout many times over my years, in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s. Now in my 50s, I'm starting to learn. And, you know, it's taken, it's taken you know, a very long time and certainly haven't got it 100% right, but I'm more aware. I'm definitely aware when I feel myself kind of going anywhere near burnout. I'm like, no, nope, got to stop that now, got to do something, whether that is meditation, yeah. checking out, going to a retreat or just going for a long walk. 
But I, I do love your honesty because there's many, many times just like you're going through now where I've just had to push through, done the all-nighters, you know, that that's just a reality of having your mm. own business. So I think that's a good message for everyone out there. You know, there is no perfect. It's, you know, your season of life, but I think the awareness around, you know, the importance of our health, because as you rightly said, it's a long game. This is a, this is a long mm. game. So you've got to have that stamina and that health, that longevity to be able to do all of the wonderful things um, that we all want to do in business. So I think any support that you can kind of integrate, like a little reminder to eat lunch, I think would be a good one. I actually had someone text me today, so sweet. I met her in the morning um, at the Fashion Week um, coffee thing. And then I said, like, we actually in the middle of warehouse move at the moment. Yeah. So I'm like, today is going to be pretty hectic for me. And literally at lunchtime, I got a text and she said, hey, where are you moving to? And then she's like, I bet you probably forgot to eat lunch again. Can I bring you lunch? And I was like, oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Um, but I saw it when I was actually eating lunch. So that was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. We'll, t- we'll take that as a win. We'll definitely take that as a win. <laughs> we have a win today. Um, definitely yeah. had a win. Now, Shania, in closing, we'd love for you to share your vision for the future of re-commerce and how you feel it will contribute to the future of fashion. Mm. Um, In an ideal world, I want to build an economy where brands can earn more with less, consumer can have more access with less cost and less waste, and then that is probably the ideal future of the fashion industry where we have our limited access, but we actually supply it in a much, much more smarter and more efficient way. I love that. What a succinct and profound message. Now, Shania, no doubt we're going to have many of our listeners wanting to get in touch with you and your business. What's the process like? So when they send in their inquiry, who will they be speaking to? Will they be speaking to you if a brand would like to inquire about getting involved? Yeah, absolutely. Um, often it's me on the call. Yeah. Um, again, small team. Yeah. <laughs> often it's me on the call. Um, I think for me at this point, I'm still learning about my customer. Yeah. So I need to understand who you are, what do you need? And like, we'll be able to say whether like, can we actually help right now? Or our product and our pipeline was essentially, you know, in the next three months, this would be perfect for you kind of thing. But yeah, get in touch, go on a website, book a demo. You'll definitely see my face. Um, or yeah, I'm super active on LinkedIn as well. You can just slap me a message and often I usually just say hi. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Shania, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing everything about Renta. Congratulations to you and your lean team for everything you've achieved in what I would say is a short period of time. Congratulations about, you know, all of the amazing brands that you've already onboarded. So here's to many more and uh, we'll be following your journey and do what we can to help to spread the word as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Fashion Business Mindset Podcast. We'd love to keep connected. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Fashion Equipped. Head to our website, fashionequipped.com.au. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share this podcast with others. Hit subscribe, leave us a rating and review. Let's do this together. Let's make the fashion business your business. This is a Guide Your Light Network production, creating podcasts with purpose.